Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. On today's show, Trump tries to tank a bipartisan immigration deal because he wants to use the border crisis as a campaign issue. Biden gets great economic news following a big endorsement from the United Auto Workers. And later, I talk to former Congresswoman Liz Cheney about the dangers of a second Trump term and how she plans to stop it from happening. Liz Cheney on Pod Save America. That's where we're at, Dan. That's 2024. Chris, Chris Christie, Vivek Ramaswamy, Liz Cheney. You know what? Big tent. We're big tent. The left's answer to Fox News. Here you go. <laughs> but first, Donald Trump and all the MAGA goons are trying to push Nikki Haley out of the race. But as of right now, she's not just sticking around. She's actually showing some fight. She's running ads in South Carolina. Her super PAC had its biggest day of fundraising this week. And here she is at a rally in her home state having some fun with Trump's meltdown on Tuesday night. So we got out there and we did our thing and we said what we had to say. And then Donald Trump got out there and just threw a temper tantrum. <laughs> he pitched a fit. He was, he was insulting. He was doing what he does. But I know that's what he does when he's insecure. I know that's what he does when he is threatened. And he should feel threatened, without a doubt. You look at what's happening. And out of everything that he said in his rant, he didn't talk about the American people once. He talked about revenge. Well, Dan, looks like she didn't follow the DeSantis path of uh, dropping out after a few days. Who would have guessed? I want to say two things. Yes, One, go ahead, please. What, don't worry, I'll get to where you want me to get to <laughs> first. <laughs> it's been... Less than forty-eight hours. That's true. It took that's the true. it took the Sanders longer than that to get out of this get that's out of true. the race after that's Iowa. That's true. So that's one. But two, I will acknowledge that perhaps I was overly negative, <laughs> maybe put off by sort of the fanboy vibes that you and Lava were putting out on <laughs> my, on Tuesday night. And maybe she, maybe you are you're going to end up being correct, and she will be in this through South Carolina and maybe beyond. My analysis of. What her odds are into that has not changed, but I will stipulate that she she has shown more fight in the 48 hours since the New Hampshire primary than I expected, which is a good thing for the process, for Democrats trying to beat Donald Trump, and for people who have to do three podcasts a week. So <laughs> kudos. And again, I share your analysis of what the final outcome will be. Always have. And I will separate what I want to happen <laughs> And what I think will happen, hmm. obviously, what I want to happen hmm. is for Nikki Haley to stay in this race as long as possible, because anything that happens in this country or the world that even has a chance of damaging Donald Trump politically, I am for, which is why I really want her to stay hmm. in. Now, what I think will happen, I also think she'll stay in through South Carolina for all the reasons that I talked about on uh, on uh, Tuesday night. And I just think, you know. Uh, I think she's going to lose some donors. She's already lost some donors. Um, she's, uh, she's still down about uh, 30 points in South Carolina. She's got the, uh, most of the Republican Party pressuring her to drop out, including the ostensibly neutral RNC chair, Ronna McDaniel. So she's got some challenges. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The big one being uh, Republicans have yet to vote for her in any of these races. So yeah. That's the challenge. Well, I'm not, I'm talking about challenges of like, does she stay in through South Carolina? Or yeah, not? yeah. So yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. still think there's a, there's definitely a, I still think there's a chance she drops out before South Carolina. But I think I'm I'm more likely than not. I think she at this point is is going to stick it out uh, because I think even though she's losing some donors, you know, that she's still raising money. Some other donors are staying in there. Uh, I mean. Which is not totally surprising. Like, when have billionaires ever been known to make shrewd political decisions or have good political analysis? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And again, she is, she's thinking to herself, why not? She's like, she's been excommunicated from the party at this point. Like, if she had dropped out after Iowa, um, maybe she could have gotten herself back in Trump's good graces and the party's good graces. She competed in New Hampshire. She chose to compete in New Hampshire which is crossing the Rubicon. Now Trump hates her. MAGA hates her. She is persona non grata in the party. And I, at this point, it's like, what do you got left to lose? Dignity. Uh, I mean, she was Trump's UN ambassador, said he was bad, said I, he was good again, said he was I understand that. <laughs> She's lost the, that. The reason why she would get out, if she were to get out, which she very well may not, yeah. I'd like to stipulate for you, is, is 
losing your home state mm. by 30 points would be that that'd be personally painful for a lot of people right does it does she have a political future in that state unlikely does she have a political future in the republican party maybe but prob- potentially uh, probably unlikely uh yeah. it, if donald trump loses in tw- in the, ge- the general election then maybe she does but people generally don't like to lose their home states by a lot now i will say I went looking through the the quote unquote polling that we have on South Carolina, and we're yeah. all hinging this thirty percent number on one Emerson poll. That when you click on the link, it comes out in an Excel spreadsheet, um, <laughs> which is not to say that it's not a good poll. It very well may be, but I would like to see some. And that poll was before Iowa. I'd like to see some more recent polling. But you would, if that poll is correct, you would have to just be very concerned with Nikki Haley because everyone, the point she made, everyone knows you. And they're currently choosing the other guy. Um, yeah. So, but let's see some other, we may get some point that shows it in a two-person race closer, right? Because there are, while most DeSantis voters are for Trump, there are some of them who were Haley voters. There were some, you know, there's a percent or two of Ace Hutchinson voters or whatever. Some of the Tim Scott voters, even if he endorsed Trump, probably end up in Haley's camp. There are whatever... The seven people in South Carolina are probably going to vote for Chris Christie. They end up in Haley's camp. She could get to a number that's more respectable than down 30, which would give it some juice and interest, even if she still has to find a way to win a state, a very Republican state, where in the 2016 Republican primary, 72% of primary voters were evangelical Christians, a group she's getting clobbered with. So. Yeah. And that's I mean, what's indisputable, whatever the polls show, is that Mm -hmm. not only is the South Carolina electorate worse for her than the New Hampshire electorate, it is like worse by a magnitude. Like it could it doesn't get much worse. (laughs) Yeah, it was 20, 20 percent of New Hampshire voters were evangelical Christian. Yeah. So it is. It's tough. It's now look, Democrats and independents, of course, can vote in the primary if they want. There's not a ton of them in South Carolina either, no. and a lot of them will be. A lot of Democrats will be voting in the Democratic primary that comes first uh, for Joe Biden. So, although if I was a if I was a voter in South Carolina, I might uh, just to keep keep the fun going, I might vote for Nikki Haley. Sure, why not? Right in the primary, the, what? Well, who cares? Um, John Favreau. John Favreau announces he would vote for Nikki Haley over Joe Biden. <laughs> cool, cool. I didn't say that's just fake news at the end. <laughs> um, I mean, you said you yeah. said you would in vote the primary. for Nikki for in the Nikki Democratic Haley primary. Over, yeah. I'm obviously going to write in Dan Pfeiffer. Um, <laughs> if you were uh, parachuted into Nikki Haley's campaign as senior advisor, uh, what do you do for the next few weeks? What do the next few weeks look like? <laughs> First, I would say, Nikki, you clearly have not taken my advice to drop out right now that I offered on Tuesday night. But since we are in it, here's what you have to come to terms with. The odds of victory are quite long. For you to win would require an upset of a magnitude that has not happened in modern political history. So there are two outcomes to this campaign. One is you win. The other one is that your time in politics is over. You leave diminished, embarrassed. You will never be invited to a Republican Party function again. You will never run for office as a Republican again. You will probably spend your days either outside of politics or hosting a podcast with Liz Cheney on the Crooked Media Network. That Uh, that's not a bad future. That's I mean, but and so I would say to her, if you have any interest in the former winning, you have to be willing to accept the probability of the latter. And that means you have to be all in, 100% in. You have to make an argument against Trump every day, a brutally honest argument about how you truly feel about him and how dangerously unfit he is, how people, Republicans who nominate Donald Trump are putting this election, their party, and the country at risk. You have to be willing to say that he could be running, that the Republicans are about to nominate someone who could be running for president from prison and go all in. And then tactically, We have to begin looking beyond South Carolina. And that includes looking at states like Virginia, which uh, you're not going to believe this, but you know who won Virginia in 2016? Marco Rubio. Marco Rubio, right? (laughs) But so a state like Marco Rubio, like Michigan, a place where the independents go, they wrote this in their memo that we talked about on Monday. And you have to be willing to go all the way to the convention. Because if you were in, you were in through the Jack Smith trial. You're in through countless hamburgers. (laughs) You're in, you're all the way in and be ready to take it to the convention and say that. And there's a small chance you could possibly win. It's going to require a tremendous amount of luck, some some exogenous events, but you got to be all the way in. There is no pulling your punches 
for how dangerous this guy is. And you'll still probably lose. But you would. But if you really believe he's this dangerous, the right thing to do is to make that case to the country. Dan, that advice is uh, it's music to my ears. <laughs> I thought it would be. <laughs> <laughs> I want to. Believe, I want her to go out in a blaze of glory. Look, she's already. Uh, she's she's not there yet. Who knows if she'll ever get there? But um, I do think. He didn't talk about the American people. He's only talking about revenge. She's she's tiptoeing closer to the Chris Christie message that Donald Trump is about Donald Trump. He's about himself. He only cares about himself. He doesn't care about anyone else, which I think is, to me, the most effective message. I think it's great for Biden. I think it's great for Democrats. It just happens to be true. It's true. The, be- the best messages are also true, <laughs> which is that Donald Trump <laughs> is a fucking narcissist who only gives a shit about himself, his election, whether he wins. Like, he, there is no such thing as loyalty. There's, there's no one he cares about except himself. He is running for president to punish his enemies, re- enrich himself, and reward his politically connected friends. And so she should just, you know, go all out. What do you? This is it. What do you get to lose? You're like your career is already your career in Republican politics is already over. So right, you get the Cricket podcast. Maybe you get an MSNBC slot. You you go to you're going to Davos. You're giving lots of speeches. She'll be you'll be, you'll be on boards. It's fine. She'll be fine. She'll she'll be embarrassed among Republicans, but like sh- that's already the case. Yeah, the embarrassing thing is being a Republican right now. Also, we know that she really thinks that Trump is unfit for like she has told us this several times before she's changed her position <laughs> for political expediency. <laughs> so it's like we know that she can do it. She's done it before. She now she's just got to stay there. And look, I mean, again, what do you get to lose? What do you get to lose? Um, Clearly, Donald Trump isn't happy about any of this. He took a quick break from attacking the woman a jury has held him liable for raping. 37 posts about E. Jean Carroll in just 20 minutes the other day. Uh, He also, by the way, uh, testified. We're recording this Thursday. He testified uh, for three minutes at the trial, uh, at the defamation trial today in New York before the judge shut him up because he was trying to say that he didn't do it, which the judge said, we already adjudicated this at another trial, so just stop, and they went off the stand. So that was Donald Trump testifying. Uh, so he took a break from attacking E. Jean Carroll, and he started attacking the woman still running against him. Quote, I knew Nikki well. She was average at best. Anybody that makes a contribution to bird brain from this moment forth will be permanently barred from the MAGA camp. What do you think that means? Uh, does that mean that Haley's supporters won't be invited to Mar-a-Lago to help uh, Donald Trump cover up more crimes? Does it mean uh, they're not going to be able to take part in the next insurrection? What, what's MAGA camp? I don't think we want to know, John. I really don't. <laughs> I know that we're going to be in the other camp that's not the MAGA yeah, camp. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think the other camp is the one you really don't want to be in, right, if Donald Trump wins, yes. We're going to see Nikki Haley, Chris Christie, Mike Pence. They're all going to be in the other, yeah, the other the camp. Yeah, the re-education camp run by Greg Gutfeld and Jesse Waters that we'll be staying in. Yeah, yeah that one. that's it. That's our camp. I mean, I look, this is a message clearly designed for about 30 rich people in America. And these rich people, they don't love Donald Trump. Obviously, they obviously do have not read the demographic. Uh, they have the delicate rules or the demographic makeup of South Carolina and are putting money in Nikki Haley's campaign. But they also like being in the mix. And so what he's really saying is, if you back Nikki Haley after today, you're not coming to the inauguration. You're not coming to the White House. You're not getting invited to Mar-a-Lago. You got uh, you got some special favors you need from a junior EPA official who's handing out you know waivers on pollution. You're not getting those. That you will just you're going to be you're not going to be part of the mix, and that's why all these people who we saw this in uh, 2016, all these Republican billionaires did not get involved in the general election because they assumed Trump would lose. As soon as he won, they all wrote gigantic checks to the inaugural so that they could be part of it, right, and get invited to all the stuff. And so that's that's essentially the message he's giving to those people. He's a mob boss. That's what it is. He's that's uh, how he thinks. Absolutely. I mean, he, it's just the the Republican National Committee. Uh, The dispatch broke the story today. The Republican National Committee is reviewing a draft resolution from David Bossy of uh, Citizens United slash Trump campaign fame uh, that declares Trump, declares Trump the nominee before the 48 other states have voted. They just they are so Republicans are so afraid of people voting. They're even afraid of their own voters voting that they want to just declare that the primary is over, the nomination over and Trump has won. Now, the rules say that uh, Trump 
would still have to win the delegates. But if they pass this resolution, uh, the RNC can start working with him, which, you know, I mean, Ronna McDaniel was on TV basically sounding like she was going to do that anyway. This is just more evidence that Donald Trump is essentially an incumbent president running for reelection. Yeah. Like that's the DNC is working with Joe Biden because he's the incumbent president and he is in charge of the DNC. All the people working with the RNC, including Ronna Romney McDaniel, were appointed by him. They're, they exist. They're there because of him. That piece of paper, as sent, in terms of, as you point out, in terms of the delegate math means nothing. It's a it's just it's a it could be a tweet for all of all of its value. But it's another way to go around to donors and others to say and the and the small handful of endorsers that Nikki Haley has and say this thing is over. Get on board. It's time to go beat Joe Biden, which is what their message is. And that's usually what presumptive nominees do when they think they have this thing locked up. It's what where we were when Obama had to be developed an insurmountable delegate lead over Hillary Clinton in 2008. It's the argument that Hillary Clinton tried to make to Bernie Sanders in 2016. And so that part is unusual. The RNC doing the bidding of the leading candidate is unusual, um, yeah. but it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, Trump has also been taunting Haley about how he already won Nevada, where there's a primary on February 6th and a caucus on February 8th. You want to tell people what that's all about? Yeah, yeah this is a, this is pretty interesting and kind of stupid all at the same time. Nice. Uh, so as we remember, in the past, Nevada has had caucuses to decide as part of their being one of the early states. In the 2020 Democratic caucus, there was a lot of chaos about how the reporting was done. Wasn't really sure uh, who got what votes, where they came from. A couple campaigns sued. There was also the disaster in the Democratic caucus in Iowa, the real blowback against caucuses generally. So at, just as a refresher, caucuses are run by parties. Primaries are run by state, secretary of states and election offices. So Nevada passed a law. The Nevada liked being early in the process and they liked the attention. So the Nevada state legislator passed a law that said, we're going to have a, a presidential primary on February 6th. The idea would be candidates in both parties would compete in it. The Nevada Republican Party is run by Trump loyalists, so much so that the chair of the party, even though they are hosting this early caucus in primary, endorse, has already endorsed Trump, which is definitely not sketchy at all. And they decided, they believed correctly in my view, that a caucus would be much better for Trump than a primary, especially one that had uh, same day registration where people could walk in and register and vote. And so what the party said was, sure, you can hold your caucus on that day, but we decide how our delegates are allocated. That's up to the party. You can hold any primary you want, but it's not going to be worth anything, much like the New Hampshire primary had no delegates for Democrats. So we're going to we're just going to hold our caucus and that's where all the delegates are going to go. Everyone believed that that was rigged for Donald Trump as it clearly is. So Haley and DeSantis and the others didn't participate in it. They didn't want to give it. They didn't want to turn it into this contest where Trump would just win by a lot and it would seem like a huge victory. It would be easier to not compete because there's only a small handful of delegates compared to the 1,215 you need for the nomination. And the, But what is interesting is the reason Trump is not on the primary ballot is the at Trump's urging, the, the Nevada Republican Party said, if you, in order to participate in the caucus, you can and get and have access and be able to win those delegates, you cannot be on the primary ballot. So it, this is the example of something that Nikki Haley will face if she stays in this race: is Donald Trump's campaign has very strategically and cleverly rigged the rules all across, use party loyalists all across the country to rig the rule, the delegate rules in his favor. And this is one very resonant example, which is why he's on the ballot. Nikki Haley isn't. He gets all those delegates just by being just for no reason. He doesn't do anything and he gets free delegates. It's almost as if Trump and his supporters have a problem with people deciding things because they think that whatever they decide, everyone else should have to live with. And so therefore, they want to take away people's right to choose for themselves. Yes, that seems to be a theme that is running through a lot here. And if the voters do something that we don't like, then we will Again. just – Violence, right? That's right. <laughs> do what we want or violence is essentially the MAGA ethos. That's right. Uh, well, it also uh, bleeds over to Congress, even though he's – Trump is not an elected official right now. Uh, he is dictating the Republican Party's legislative strategy. Uh, Punchbowl reported that during a closed-door meeting on Wednesday, Mitch McConnell told Republicans that Trump doesn't want a deal on immigration that would address the border crisis because – Trump wants to use the problem as a campaign issue against Joe Biden. And McConnell reportedly said, quote, we don't want to undermine Trump because he's going to be the Republican nominee. 
This led to a lot of grumbling among Republican senators who were close to a deal with Democrats, uh, including Mitt Romney. Let's listen. Oh, I, I, think, I think the border is a very important issue for uh, Donald Trump. Uh, and the fact that he would communicate to uh, Republican senators and Congress people that he doesn't want us to solve the border problem because he wants to blame uh, Biden for it is uh, is really appalling. So McConnell doesn't like Trump. Uh, he really wants to pass Ukraine funding, which won't get done if there's no immigration deal. Um, why do you think he seems to be giving up? It, it seems like he there's there's conflicting reports about the meeting itself. And some Republicans are now saying McConnell wasn't saying we should defer to Trump, but he was just sort of bowing to the reality that this is what Trump wants. And therefore, they're not going to have the Republican votes to help pass the deal. There, I think it is McConnell bowing to two realities. The first is that his caucus was pretty divided on this. There was a punchable report from the day, be- from the day before or earlier this week that detailed how the, the Senate caucus lunch, or Senate Republican caucus lunch got very heated with like the, the Josh Hawley's and Ted, Ted Cruz's of the world being, Ron Johnson's being very upset about this immigration deal and being very aggressive and the fact that they don't know what's in the deal. Um, and then the other reality here is the House is not going to pass it. So if you're from McConnell's perspective, you're going to anger your caucus. You're going to anger your party nominee who you now need to raise money and campaign for your Senate candidates to win in these in these red states where they're, they're trying to do it like Montana and Ohio for a bill that is very unlikely to become law because Mike Johnson, who's even who is in the thrall of Trump in a way McConnell isn't all the time, has already said we're not going to pass it. We want H.R. 2 or whatever it is, their border bill, which has no chance of passing the Senate or being signed by the president. So it's like, why take on all that water for no reason? Tom Tillis, who's been negotiating the deal, is also pretty mad in addition to what Romney said. He uh, Tillis said, it's all about politics and not having the courage. He's talking about his fellow senators. He said, it's all about politics and not having the courage to respectfully disagree with President Trump. I didn't come here to have a president as a boss or a candidate as a boss. Tough news for you, Tom. Uh, most of your colleagues very much enjoy having Donald Trump as a boss and see him yeah. as their boss, even though he is yeah. not. I mean, it is just worth noting that all of these Republicans say the border is the biggest national security threat to the country. There was fentanyl coming across the border. They make up these apocryphal stories about Hamas terrorists coming across the border and given the opportunity to do something about it now. And something that would be pretty Republican friendly. It's kind of a once in a generation opportunity for them to do border security without comprehensive immigration reform. On their terms, with a lot of leverage, They walk away from that in order to help Donald Trump win an election. When we know that the deal that that if Trump were to win, they're not going to get that deal because – and Mitch McConnell has said that, that there's no way with unified Republican government without the leverage of the Ukraine bill, they're going to get such a deal. So they are are simply – they say this is the biggest problem in the world. They talk about it every single day. They foam in about it. It dominates Fox News. And given that they would rather not solve it in order to win an election. People will lose their lives. Dangerous things will happen because of that choice. And it's like you just have to hammer on the dangerous cynicism of what happens when Donald Trump's in charge of the Republican Party. Yeah. I mean, look, I I know this might sound surprising to you, but um, it doesn't seem like uh, the political genius who uh, controls the Republican Party made a very strategic move here uh, on this uh, on this immigration bill. Like, I know he wants to run on the issue, but he's sort of by being so open about it. Trump has given, I think, Nikki Haley, if she wants it, and certainly uh, Joe Biden and the Democratic Party, a huge opening to just hit him over the head with this from now until November, that every time that Republicans talk about the border now, Biden can say, we were willing to meet you halfway, work with Republicans, get something done, and you wanted to campaign on it. You wanted to campaign on it. So now he can throw it in Trump's lap, even though Trump's not the incumbent. I mean, the best thing for President Biden Substantively politically, I think, would be to get a deal, yeah. presuming the details of the deal are things that are acceptable to him and his party, and get the aid for Ukraine. Like, that would be a bipartisan accomplishment. Like, if your choice is stand on stage at this possible debate that may or may not happen and say, and Trump attacks the border and say, well, I actually did this bipartisan thing that did X, Y, and Z, is a better argument than you, blo- you, you, uh, you torpedoed it. the deal. But you torpedoed the deal is still a pretty good argument, and it's one that Biden and Democrats up and down the ballot, I think, should hammer 
relentlessly. And by the way, Nikki Haley should do it in South Carolina. She should say, this is exactly what I'm talking about. He didn't fix the border when he was president. He doesn't care about fixing the border now. He doesn't care about the American people. He only cares about himself. He only cares about winning. Biden should say the same thing uh, if this ends up not happening. Uh, Donald Trump killed the border deal, not because it wasn't good enough for the country, because it wasn't good for him. You know, I mean, you just say this all day long. I have a very prescriptive message box coming up about how to talk about this tomorrow morning. Oh. Um, it's in the editing process now, John, just to bring you behind the curtain. But uh, Meaning it's it's probably out right now. We're taking this on Thursday. People are going to hear well, this yes, Friday yes. morning. People, yeah. The, depending on how early you wake up East Coast time, you could be have already read the message box by the time you listen to this. But one point I want to make is there will be this tendency among some Democrats to use this as a way to say, see, Donald Trump's the one who's soft on the border. Right. You remember when Democrats went around saying that Republicans are the ones who defunded the police because they cut funding for local police burns, which is actually a tr- substantively true statement. It is substantively true that, d- that there was a chance to make the border more secure. Donald Trump opposed it. Therefore, he is soft the border. But the attack has to be believable. Yeah. And voters are not going to believe that Donald Trump, who is known for the wall and for cruel immig- anti-immigrant rhetoric and policies, you have to make it about Donald Trump putting himself and his interest over what's the best for the country. They don't they may not believe he, they will not believe he's soft on the on the border, but they will believe that he is a self-interested narcissist. Yeah. And that's that that is the way to make this that he is putting politics, he's putting his own interests above the country's. And that is the core of what I think that argument should be. Which is by the way, the narrative of almost all the news we've talked about today and a message that is available to Nikki Haley and uh Democrats. <laughs> yeah. So and it, Biden, the Biden folks have been doing a lot of yeah, this. Oh, I, they, no, they've been doing it. about the border yet, but yeah, but not yeah, not with the border because it hasn't mm. come up yet, but for a whole yeah. bunch of other stuff they've been doing this. Yeah. Um So I'd say that Joe Biden is having a pretty good week. He won 64 percent of the vote uh, in the New Hampshire primary, despite not even appearing on the ballot. We learned on Thursday that even though a lot of economists uh, predicted a recession, uh, the economy grew at a healthy 3.1 percent clip last year, which is higher growth than any year under Donald Trump, even before the pandemic. Uh, Biden also won the endorsement of the United Auto Workers, one of the biggest unions in the country, and he joined uh, UAW President Sean Fain in an event this week. Donald Trump is a scab. (laughs) Donald Trump is a billionaire, and that's who he represents. In fact, when Donald Trump was in office, six auto factories closed around the country. Tens of thousands of auto jobs were lost nationwide during Trump's presidency. During my presidency, we've opened 20 auto factories and more to come. We've created more than 250,000 auto jobs all across America. So uh, not entirely unexpected endorsement, but still a pretty big deal. What do you think? A huge deal. Very important. And I think... Biden should campaign with Sean Fain as often as possible in this election. I think Sean Fain's an incredible messenger. I think what Biden has done for unions, he is the most pro-union president in modern history. He has, through his administration, and we're existing in a time of like resurgent union power with the organizing efforts that are happening at Starbucks and Amazon, all these other places across the country, he should make that part of his story because it is it is Ultimately, all politics on the economy, message on the economy, is not about what policies you implement, it's who you're fighting for. And the labor stuff is about Biden fighting for working people all across the country, big cities, small towns, white, black, Latino, everyone, right? And so that I think that's an important story that should be told everywhere, right? And he should be with union members all the time. Unions have never been more popular than they are right now, right? For in, at least in the last 30 or so years. And take advantage of that, use that association to tell a story about the kind of president you have been and will be if you get a second term. I also think Donald Trump has always screwed over working people. Uh, This seems like a good message, uh, especially when you've got all these polls showing that most voters prefer Trump to Biden on the economy right now. Um, How do you think the Biden campaign can break through with that message? Because that's always the challenge. That is that is that is the que- the follow up question to everything we say about the messaging. One other interesting thing I want to say there is when Biden said that about the auto plants closing under Trump, mm. that is not just a throwaway line. There was some internal polling done by Democratic groups that I saw last year that showed that one of the better message against Trump is that he said he was going to keep all of these plants and factories open and a whole bunch of them closed. Mm. Um, and so. He is he's that that's not an accident that he's doing that. And the Biden folks, 
ran an ad in Michigan back when Trump was oh, going yeah. to do that fake union rally that made this exact point. Um, so I think we're going to see more of that. And it, it's going to be – it's just there is not like one – thing to break one thing you're going to do that's going to break through getting the uaw endorsement some attention you're gonna to have to be a bunch of ads about this you have to directly go at donald trump you have to do it all the time every day and sometimes it's going to be the visuals you have right being being with these union members which is why biden going to the picket line was such a big moment because it, w- it was a moment that broke through so you have to find some of those moments as well but it's gonna there's not you're just gonna to have to do it all day every day with the president with ads, with surrogates to to drive that message home. And you have to go right at Donald Trump on this. It can't be subtle. Well, I was going to say, I think it requires a, an evolution of the Biden message around the economy, which is like so far, every time there's good economic news, the Biden folks sort of trumpet the good economic news. You know, if, if the media doesn't cover it, they, you know, criticize the media for not covering it. And I get why they do all that. But now that we're in the general election against Trump, I think, you know, you get this great economic news today about the economy growing. By the way, Joe Biden's been fighting for that. He's going to continue to fight for a good economy. If Donald Trump gets in office again, he has already said he can't wait to give another huge tax cut to CEOs. And for everyone else, he's going to increase the cost of your prescription drugs, increase the cost of your health care. And by the way, he's going to slap a 10 percent tax on every single good that's imported. Uh, because this is he wants to bring back all he wants to do these tariffs, which has not been getting a lot of attention. But uh, talk about inflation and the cost of living. Imagine if anything that had any parts that weren't made in America mm. had a 10 percent tax on it, what that would do to consumers and small businesses across the country. I mean, it's crazy. I think there is a um, there's just a big strategic question that I do not know the answer to and do not have the data to give that answer. But that I think is is at the core of what we're talking about here is in order to make that case effectively that you are better than Trump, how much do you have to convince people about what you have done and how it's worked? And you sort of and I think the Biden people, I'm just guessing this based on how, you don't they're not up on the air right now. So you other than this abortion ad that uh, that you guys talked about the other day on the podcast, other than that abortion ad, they're not up on the air. So we don't we're not seeing that they're tested messages about the economy. We see a bunch of tweets and some, you know, some throwaway stuff that's happening on social media. But they that stuff suggests they think it's very important to trumpet every bit of good economic news. Like a single economist goes on Fox News and says something positive about the Biden economy, they're they're trying to get out to as many people as possible. Now, is that audience their own voters, right, to be tribunes of that good news? I don't know the answer to that, but Ultimately, do you have to, you know, do you need to invest that time and energy to convince people what you did and that it mattered in order to get people to believe that you're, that you are to get to that equal footing enough where you can battle Trump on the economy? I just don't know. One other piece of news from the Biden campaign, our friends Jen O'Malley Dillon and Mike Donilon are leaving the White House to help Julie Chavez Rodriguez run the campaign in Wilmington full time. Uh, What's your take on that move? Look, I think that people, if they have the opportunity to move to Wilmington, Delaware, should do that. <laughs> Didn't ex- I should have expected that take from you. Yes. I did not. I did not. Yes. Yes. Um, um, I, th- I think this was, that was something that was always going to happen. I don't know whether this was the timing that was always planned. Maybe if the Republican primary had extended longer. Because uh, the Biden people clearly think that it is over. They basically said that in their statement on yeah. Tuesday night. But Jen... And Mike are two of the smartest, most accomplished operatives in the Democratic Party. The things they do cannot be cannot that they specialize in can't really be done from the White House in the way some of the stuff that you and I worked on can be done from the White House. Jen is a is she's obviously a extremely experienced campaign manager. Ran his campaign in 2020. She's run other lots of other campaigns, but she's what she thinks about is organizing voter contact, how to use data to reach voters. That you can't really do from the White House. And Mike Donilon. Is an admin. He's a message guy and a speechwriter and all these other things. You can do some of that for the White House, since you were a speechwriter who worked on a camp worked on a campaign in your spare time for the White House. What you can't do is make political ads for the White House e- effectively and efficiently. And yeah. Biden's going and he's and he oversaw the the billion dollar paid media budget in 2020. I'm sure he's going to do the same thing here. You got to be in the campaign to do it. So I think this was always inevitable, and I think it's a welcome sign that they are quickly ramping up to be on general election footing. Yeah, it it certainly feels this week like. Uh all my Nikki Haley fantasies notwithstanding, the general yeah. election has begun and the Biden people get that and they are ramping up as well. And everyone's starting to see a lot more of Trump. So 
Uh, hopefully things start getting going from now on. When we come back, Liz Cheney. Pod Save America is brought to you by Beam. Are you having trouble sleeping or staying asleep? Is poor sleep negatively impacting your life? Have you tried other sleep supplements with no success? If so, you got to try Beam. Beam. I used to have trouble sleeping. Now I drink Beam out like a light. Yeah, this is still a dream. Yeah. This is part of a dream. I, I, I'm, yeah, we're both naked. I mostly sleep. <laughs> And we're on a I'm, plane. I'm not awake. I'm only awake for these podcasts. <laughs> sleep is the foundation of our mental and physical health. When you are sleeping well, you can perform at your best mentally and physically. The proper, problem with this dream is we. This country needs to wake up. Proper. You know what oh I mean? God. Proper sleep can also increase focus, boost energy, and improve your mood. Better jokes too. Introducing <laughs> Beams Dream Powder, a science-backed, healthy hot cocoa for sleep. And today. Listeners get a special discount on Beam's Dream Powder. They're science-backed, healthy hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar. Better sleep has never tasted better. The numbers don't lie. In a clinical study, 93% of participants reported Dream helped them get better sleep. Beam Dream is easy to add to your nighttime routine. Just mix Dream into hot water or milk, froth, and enjoy before bed. If you want to try Beam's best-selling Dream Powder, get up to 40% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash crooked and use code crooked at checkout. That's shop, B-E-A-M dot com slash crooked and use code crooked for up to 40% off. Joining us today, the vice chair of the January 6th committee and author of the new book, Oath and Honor, a memoir and a warning, former Wyoming representative Liz Cheney. Welcome to Pod Save America. Great to be with you, John. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, so in 2004, I was working on John <laughs> Kerry's campaign while you were working on the Bush Cheney reelect. And if someone had told me then, <laughs> <laughs> the two of us would be chatting about how to save American democracy from the uh, former host of The Apprentice, I'd have a few questions. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but here, but here we are. That's um, right. So it's the day after Donald Trump won the New Hampshire primary. What do you make of Nikki Haley's decision to stay in the race? And, uh, and do you see a path for her? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I, I hope she stays in the race, um, you know, as long as, as she has to. Um, I think certainly, you know, through Super Tuesday, um, I think that uh, we're in a situation where only two states have voted. And you had something like, you know, over 35 percent, I believe, of the Republicans coming out um, of uh, the voting in New Hampshire uh, said they would never vote for Donald Trump. And uh, so we're obviously, you know, looking at um, uh, a significant portion of the Republican Party uh, that that is supporting him. Um, but ultimately, this is going to be about being able to win independence. Uh, and in a general election, uh, surely Nikki Haley fares much better than Donald Trump does. Um, and and even more important than that is where you began, which is um, the threat that he poses what we watched him do in the lead up to January 6th, uh, his attempt to seize power uh, presents an existential threat. And so we need to make sure that we're we're challenging him and working to defeat him at every step of the way. Uh, and and right now, Nikki Haley is is in this fight. And, and I think she ought to stay in it. Are you uh, are you officially supporting Haley over Trump now that it's just the two of them left? Or do you not? Uh, might that hurt her? <laughs> I have, yeah, I mean, I haven't made any formal endorsements Um uh, at this point, but certainly I would I would never support or vote for Donald Trump again. You um you said you're considering a third party run for president, but that you won't do anything uh, that would help Trump win. Have you seen any data that suggests a run by any independent candidate would help defeat Trump and not help elect him? I, I certainly think that um, uh, there are people on both sides of the aisle, there are Republicans and Democrats, um, and you've seen all the polling that shows, you know, 70% of the people are dissatisfied with having, you know, the choice be Trump versus Biden. Um, and, and so I think it matters very much, um, you know, what the overall uh, terrain looks like. Uh, I think that we certainly are going to have more than two parties in this race. You've already got independents uh, in, uh, on the left. And um, and I think we'll see what happens. I, I um, again, you know, I've, my my number one priority is defeating him. And um, I think that's, you know, going to guide whatever ultimately I decide I'm going to do. Does that involve um, could you imagine telling Republicans and conservatives like you to vote for the Democratic nominee if it comes down to that? I mean, look, um, what I have done, certainly beginning in the 2022 midterms is 
um, support people that I believe are going to defend the Constitution. And um, I did that uh, with respect to Abigail Spanberger and uh, Alyssa Slotkin, uh, two Democrats, members of the House that that I know well and and served with. Uh, and and my message to people all across this country has been, look, this is not an election about partisan politics. Uh, this is an election about whether or not we're going to stand up for our democracy and for the Constitution. So I'm not, again, I'm not endorsing anybody. I'm not telling people whom uh, they should vote for. Uh, but but certainly they should they should not ever again entrust Donald Trump with the power that that we watched him abuse once and that he tells us every day he will abuse again if he's ever entrusted with it. Um, I want to ask you about making the case against Trump. I've heard of focus groups where Republican and independent voters who supported Joe Biden last time say, you know, I don't like Trump. I think he's a bad person, but I'm much more worried about cost of living or the southern border, or I just don't think Joe Biden can handle the job for another four years. And, you know, and I think Trump did a better job with the economy and the country survived Trump's first term. So, you know, maybe I'll just hold my nose and and vote for him. What do you say to that voter? And like more specifically, how do you make the threat that Trump poses to democracy real to voters who may not feel the urgency that you and I do? Yeah, it's a really important question. I think there are a couple of pieces to it. One is, I would say, you know, what's happening right now at the border is absolutely indefensible. And, um, you know, I, I talk to my new Democratic friends uh, and I can't understand why the uh, Biden administration doesn't take steps to secure the border. It makes no sense to me, um, you know, the the extent to which you've got Democratic mayors of cities across the country pleading with uh, the president to secure the border. Um, you know, it it. That is an issue that's a very real issue that that understandably drives voters. Um, now, I think that that the overall message, though, is the nation is at a moment here where um, hopefully we'll have other choices, um, but the choice can never be Donald Trump. And people have to understand that he's not the lesser of two evils. If you look at some of the opinion polling from last summer and again, most recently in the last couple of weeks, um, you see that that there are significant numbers of people who um, say they don't know enough. They don't have enough information about what Donald Trump did, for example, to make judgments about um, whether or not some of the uh, indictments against him are political or not. And so I do think that there's a big task in terms of uh, helping educate people, helping make sure people understand um, specifically the steps that he took, the plan that he oversaw to try to overturn an election. And, and I think that 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 education piece is going to be crucial. Um, I also think that ultimately this election is going to be won or lost, as they always are in, in a handful of swing states. And those happen to be the states um, where Donald Trump attempted to nullify the votes of millions of those voters in 2020. And, and so I think going into those states, making sure people there understand this is the guy that tried to seize power last time, and the method that he used to do it, one of the parts of his his plan um, was to reject your votes, to decide to to say that you know members of Congress um, can decide they're going to reject your votes and instead install the person they want, which was him. And uh, he's going to have to go into those states and make the case that those people ought to entrust him uh, with power and and with defending and protecting their vote. And I think that's going to be be challenging for him. Before we move on, you mentioned the uh, the border issue. And, you know, there's been these negotiations. Biden and uh, Senate Democrats have have moved towards Republicans on this issue. They say they want to do something about the border. I thought they were close to a deal. And then, you know, just as we were talking, um, apparently Mitch McConnell said, well, Trump wants to run on the border, so he, they don't want us to do anything about that. And that's what Mike Johnson's kind of been saying, too. So this is it seems like that's part of the issue is that even when Democrats want to work constructively with Republicans, Republicans then want to block it and then blame the Democrats for not fixing anything. Yeah, I mean, this this case in particular just strikes me as, as you know, um, really uh, disgusting. Um, you know, if if it's true that McConnell said, you know, basically, we, you know, we thought we had a deal, but now it looks like, you know, Trump's going to be the nominee and he wants to run on this. Um, I mean, that that is so cynical and and irresponsible. 
um, and, um, you know, surprising, frankly. Um, we all know how dangerous the situation is at the border. Um, I think, you know, as I said, the Biden administration, um, you know, deserves real criticism for the fact that they haven't secured the border. Um, but now for the Republicans, the Republican leader to be saying, well, we, we're not going to take any action because Trump doesn't want us to, um, you know, that that just, I think, confirms what everybody's frustrations are about about politics today and is just really, really cynical and sad that that's the position they're taking. I'm sure you heard that um, Senator Romney was saying like, oh, Biden needs a, a new argument because the democracy thing is old. And I've heard a lot of people say it's just it's hard to make it tangible for people when their concerns might be more immediate. Do you, do you have thoughts on sort of how to make the threat of a Trump second term real to people? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I have huge respect for Senator Romney, but I disagree with him on this. Uh, and I think, you know, part of this is um, making sure people understand what Trump did already. And and I think what making sure, you know, if you look at the extent to which, for example, uh, he's working so hard to delay his uh, January 6th trial and, and reminding people that the reason he's doing that is because he wants to suppress that evidence. Uh, the witnesses in that trial aren't going to be his political opponents. The people that you know have testified about um, his attempt to you know corruptly pressure the Department of Justice to corruptly pressure the Vice President to get him to do things that were illegal and unconstitutional. Um, the people who are going to testify testify to the January sixth committee um, about Trump's refusal for hours to tell mob to leave the Capitol. Um, you know, those people are the ones who know Trump best. And of course, he doesn't want that information out there before the election. But I think it's it's fundamentally important that people understand why he's trying to delay that. Uh, and I think the more that we can make sure we have in front of people um, what those individuals have said, what his White House counsel said, uh, what his attorney general said, what the, the you know, uh, head of his last campaign said, you know, those are not those aren't Democrats. You know, those are, are people Trump hired what members of his family said uh, about about the depravity of his um, unwillingness um, while he watched on television that, that violent attack, his unwillingness to tell people to stop. Um, you know, that gets to sort of a fundamental human question about what kind of a man is this? Um, and I think that you know, people will recognize and understand the threat that he poses. Uh, you're a lawyer and probably know more about the election subversion charges against Trump than anyone but Jack Smith and his team. If you were them, uh, what would be keeping you up at night? Look, I think if if you if you look at um, the work that the select committee did and um, the criminal referrals that we made, um, the certainly obviously, you know, Jack Smith has has. Um, secured his own testimony and witnesses have come in and testified in front of his grand jury. And, and it's that process on which uh, the charges are based, but, but they track very closely with, um, you know, what the select committee was able to uh, learn during our investigation. Uh, and um, I think that one of the things that we have seen to date, that's been so important um, has been the extent to which our courts have played the role that that they're supposed to play in terms of you know all the institutions of our government, um, you know with with a couple of exceptions we've we've seen judges be very um, responsible and even handed and approach this with the gravity that it it deserves. Um, I think that you know what what we're watching, what anybody who cares about the rule of law um, has to be deeply concerned about is uh, Donald Trump's efforts really on a daily basis to tear it down, uh, to use threats of violence, uh, to attack fundamental, uh, you know, the, the individuals who are involved in these cases, as well as the institutions themselves. And, and I think that, that that should cause grave concern, the fact that you've got somebody who's willing to do that, who's so close again to, um, to being the nominee of one of the two major political parties. Do you have any concern that the Supreme Court will decide that the charge of corruptly obstructing an official proceeding somehow doesn't apply to Donald Trump's attempt to overturn the election? 
Uh, well, I, my view on that is very clear. And I think, in fact, um, uh, you know, the 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 question has been one interpretation of that statute that uh, would would basically um, hold that it only applies in an instance where there was an attempt to um, destroy documents or an attempt to falsify documents that was very focused on this concept of documents. And of course, we know um, that what Donald Trump was doing included things like um, ensuring that there were fake, fraudulent electors uh, submitted to the Congress, submitted to the vice president. Uh, so even, even in a very narrow reading of 1512C2, um, I think it's pretty clear, as the select committee pointed out, that Donald Trump's, uh, that, that that reading would cover Donald Trump's actions in this case. Um, and I think it's also important to understand that, you know, the, the case that's in front of the Supreme Court on that issue is not a case that involves Trump. It's a case that involves one of the, the rioters. Um, and I, so, you know, no matter how they hold in that case, Donald Trump's connection to, um, in particular, the effort to falsify electors and ensure that those were presented to Congress uh, clearly fits within the plain meaning and the intent of that statute. What scares you most about a second Trump term? Um, the the extent to which um, we know that as president, he will refuse to enforce the rulings of our courts. And um, I think it's really important for people to understand what that means. You know, the, the na we're only a, a nation of laws um, if the president enforces the rulings of the courts. And um, to have uh, someone like Donald Trump, who we, we know won't do that, um, who we've already seen, we've we've watched the extent to which he's talked about a president deserving complete and absolute immunity. Um, the people that he would have around him, if if you look at the story of January sixth um, and the days and weeks leading up to it, he was he was stopped from doing even worse uh, things because of some of the people around him, and those people won't be around him again. Um, I also, you know, if you look at the people that he's likely to put in place, people like Mike Flynn, uh, you know, those are the very people that we're suggesting he ought to deploy the military in order to seize voting machines and, and rerun the election in swing states. Um, so he presents an existential threat. Uh, there's no question. I mean, the, 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 the list goes on. If you look at, for example, what, he's, what he says every day about, uh, you know, praising Xi, Praising Orban, praising Putin, um, the the uh, threats that we're going to withdraw from NATO, for example, um, you know, you you very quickly get into a whole series of a very serious national security threats as well. Um, but it's clear that that you know the fundamental threat to the rule of law, to the republic itself, um, you know, is is it really is an existential one. Yeah, I've heard you talk about that. And I, I hadn't really thought about it myself was that, you know, a lot of people are concerned like, oh, will the court do this or that? It's a more conservative court. But it's very possible that the court could just issue rulings and Trump ignores them. The court doesn't have any way to enforce those rulings. He can appoint whoever he'd like. Obviously, there's Senate confirmed positions, but he can get around Senate confirmed positions by just putting people temporarily in place like Mike Flynn, put them in place at the Defense Department. You know, and so that does seem like a, a real, real concern. Well, and sometimes you hear conservatives, the Wall Street Journal editorial page, for example, repeatedly says, well, you know, we have the balance of power. We have these checks and balances. We don't have to worry about it. But, you know, people really need to think about which which Republicans exactly in the House and Senate are going to stand up and stop him. You know, it's hard for me to to think of any who will. Yeah. Um and and so I I think you know it's it, it's another another reason why I think you know what we're seeing go on today specifically for example with uh, you know Rana McDaniel the chair of the RNC suggesting that you know she's determined that this race is over um, you know I, that that's uh, inappropriate to say the least um, for uh, the the chairperson of the RNC to be asserting that that you know the primary is over when it's not over. Um, and for her to be doing it when you know we know she was personally involved in the fraudulent electors scheme. Um, recently, you know, we've learned that that she was also involved in uh, uh, reportedly Trump's phone call to the officials in Michigan to try to get them to reverse 
their certification. Um, so this is, you know, th this is uh, activities and, and behavior um, that that really are un-American and undemocratic. And uh, you know, I think it's it's important that we ensure that that you know that uh, the system play out. But but first and foremost, that Donald Trump be defeated. You're out there speaking out against Trump. You hear Romney do this, Adam Kinzinger. There's a lot more polit Republican politicians and former Trump officials who've criticized Trump in the past. Do you think, do you expect them to be out there more as now that we're in 2024 speaking out against Trump? Uh, do you think that would make a difference? I, I, I do. I think it will make a difference. I think that it's going to be very important that um, we have in, a, in an organized way and also people doing it on their own, individuals who um, who have seen him up close, who've worked with him up close and who know the danger that he poses. And and again, it's an unprecedented moment. Normally, you know, particularly people who are retired military officers, as, as you know, would not would not be engaged in speaking out. Um, but, uh, you know, it's really important for people to understand the facts and the truth and in some cases, you've seen, for example, uh, retired General Kelly um, confirm some of the, the most hor horrible things that Donald Trump uh, did and said about our men and women in uniform. And, and those voices really, really matter. Um, that credibility is really important. You mentioned your former colleagues in the House. Are there any House Republicans you think are doing a, a good job right now that, that you would vote for? Um, sure. I, I think that, you know, it's a big, a big conference. Um, and, uh, there are good, good people there. There are, you know, good Republicans, certainly in office. Um, and, uh, I think that the Republican conference as a whole right now, um, has allowed the most extreme voices control. And, uh, you know, I'm, uh, not a fan of, of Mike Johnson, the current speaker of the house. Uh, you know, I've watched him, conduct himself in a way that he was doing things he knew to be wrong with respect to the the efforts to overturn the election. So I think you've got a real problem with the 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 way that the conference is led um and with you know you've got over half now the Republicans in the house have endorsed Trump um and so I I think that clearly it, it, there are some significant problems but but there are also some really good people who uh are doing a good job and representing their constituents well. And who I hope will will help come together once we get past 24 and help to to rebuild the Republican Party or build a new party, frankly, that that can really be focused on the substance of these issues. Um, you recently called uh, Elise Stefanik a, a total crackpot. No disagreement from you there. Uh, in your book, you write about how she underwent this dramatic transition from being a reasonable and thoughtful lawmaker to a Trump sycophant. Can you talk more about what it was like to watch that evolution? Because I'm, I'm sure there are many other Republican politicians who have taken that same path. Yeah, I mean, it's it never never ceases to amaze me. I mean, um, we saw it again last night, for example, with Tim Scott. I mean, it's it's you've got, you know, it, members who, you know, used to be responsible and thoughtful um, and honorable. And, you know, now for some reason they they feel that they 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 can sort of jettison all of that um, in the name of loyalty to Trump, and I, I you know I think there are a number of reasons why it goes on, um, but um, you know one of the the episodes that I talk about in the book has to do with um, you know what we were hearing after the election, but before January sixth when when members would sometimes say, well let's just do this one more thing for him if we just do this one more thing. Um, you know, then that'll be it. And, and you know, then he'll concede or, you know, we can all move on. But, you know, that one more thing becomes a slippery slope. And, you know, once you've done just one more thing and then you do just one more thing, um, uh, you know, people begin to rationalize and and you get to a point where you've sort of you've crossed you've crossed the Rubicon. And, and if you rationalize defending him after he tried to seize power and overturn an election, it's it's pretty hard to to walk walk back from that, um, and yeah. so uh, you know. But but what I would say is all all of the individuals who are doing that, you know, history teaches us that when autocrats come to power, they have to have people who are willing to 
support them and enable them uh, and collaborate with them. And and history will, you know, judge them, um, in my view, as harshly as as it, it will judge Trump because he can't do what he's doing without without them. I know a lot of never Trump Republicans whose whose politics and even policy views have changed as a result of Trump. Some of them are basically Democrats now. Some are independents. I know you're a proud conservative. You and your family have have been in Republican politics your whole lives. But I've even noticed that that your rhetoric about your policy and political differences with Democrats has has softened over the last few years. Has the Trump threat and the in the transformation of the Republican Party into a Trump party caused you to rethink any of your policy positions or or political approach? Um, my policy views haven't changed, uh, but um, living through the last three years and, and living through this moment in our politics has certainly um, caused, caused me to think uh, again and more carefully about how I engage in politics. And um, you know, I think you, you started talking about the 2004 race. You know, we've, we've been involved in many campaigns, many uh, partisan and ideological battles. And I'm not opposed to, you know, our, our nation needs partisan debate. We need to be able to do that. But but I, I think the reflexive sort of, you know, well, if the Democrats are proposing this, let me pull my talking points out to find the harsh way I can attack that. And the Democrats do the same thing to Republicans. And I think that um, that kind of reflexive attack and and the kind of, of toxicity that we've seen really um, is something we all have to, to turn away from. And and I think the best debates and, you know, the, the reason, for example, why I, I supported people like Abigail and Alyssa is because not because I agree with them on everything, uh, but but I know, like, look, if I'm going to be in a debate with Abigail Spamberger, I better be prepared because she's going to be prepared. And and I hope we'll both learn something. And you want to be engaged with people. You can sit down and say, listen, like, tell me why you believe that, because I believe this. And here's why I believe this. Um, but I, I think the country needs a lot more of that. And and I think we have to we have to really walk back from the edge of of um, of the, the toxic nature of our politics and, and the, the extreme of that is what Donald Trump has done with respect to bringing violence back into our politics in a way it hasn't been, you know, in the modern era. Do you think that's possible to do at this point, even, even if, if Trump is defeated in 2024, I I heard you talk about building possibly a new party after 2024. What would that look like? And, What's made you hopeful that there is a critical mass of, of conservatives or Republicans uh, like you who would actually join that party? Just just looking at the, the results of what Republican voters are, have been choosing over the last several years. Yeah. I, what makes me hopeful is um, as I travel around the country and I, uh, I talk to lots of people um, and, you know, the vast majority of Americans whether they're Republicans or Democrats, um, they they want their kids to grow up in a country that's free. Um, they think America ought to have the peaceful transfer of power. Um, they they want their elected officials to conduct themselves in a way that isn't embarrassing. Um, you know, one of the things I, I think is really important is for us to get more people to run for office, because you know if you and I we used to talk a lot about this actually the. Republican impeachers, you know, if you look at the the challenges we're facing and the complexity of those challenges, the, both internationally and domestically, and then you look at the caliber of the people that are getting elected today, and the gap is huge. And we're like taking people that are not competent, putting them in office, and then saying, now here, could you figure out these really complicated strategic issues and think through this in a thoughtful manner? Um and that's going to lead to disaster. So we need people to have better choices. We need more people to run. I think we need to look at things like ranked choice voting. Um, we need to look at how we conduct our primaries. Um, I think we need to look at term limits. 
I think there are some constitutional problems with term limits, and and I have not been supportive of term limits in the past. But but I think that if you if if elected officials, in order to get them to do the right thing, need to not be focused on the next race, then it may be time for us to take another look at term limits. Uh, last question: uh, what's it What's it been like to uh, become a, an unlikely resistance hero? <laughs> <laughs> disorienting <laughs> it's i mean that's a yeah it is it's it's i mean look it, it's definitely weird um in some ways um but but look it, it also it's it's one of the things that that does give me hope is how many people have, have sort of said like you know and especially young people like they don't really they they don't think about well am i a republican or a democrat you know they they they're saying you know are we are we going to live in a country um that's governed by the constitution and and i think that kind of unity and understanding and and desire to work on these issues um that gives me a lot of hope and and i i really do in a lot of ways you know i, I look forward very much to the day when you know, when I can come on your show and we can have an argument. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> and, I, I mean, it, you know, then we'll know like, OK, we got past this really huge threat. And so now we can talk about, you know, what our national security policy ought to look like. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's that'll that'll be how we know that, that we've succeeded here. Yeah. Well, look, I've often over the last couple of years, I've done a thought experiment with myself, which is, OK, say there was a president who's a Democratic president and. Uh, they're very progressive and, you know, we could get and there's a progressive Supreme Court and a progressive majority in the House and Senate. We could get everything we wanted policy wise as progressives. But that president is doing what Trump did and not respecting the rule of law and trying to overturn elections and trying to stay in power. And I really hope that not only me, but like everyone else who, who I know who are Democrats would stand up and speak out like you did. So I know I know it wasn't easy. I know it probably hasn't been easy, uh, both professionally and personally. So um, I, re I respect what you uh, what you've done these last couple of years. Well, I, I appreciate your saying that. And and um, and I, I think there are a lot a lot more people out there who, who understand and and uh, will ensure uh, by voting uh, against him that we don't end up with Donald Trump in the White House again. Yeah. But we're going to all have to work together to do that. Yes. Uh, Liz Cheney, thanks for coming on Pod Save America. And I hope next time that you're on, we uh, we can argue about policy. I know. Me too. I'll look forward to it. <laughs> right, take care. <laughs> thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks to Liz Cheney for joining us today. Uh, everyone have a great weekend and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks to Liz Cheney. Something I never thought I would hear on our podcast. But you know She's what? She's great. Thanks for coming I, legitimate, on. Legitimately, thank you to Liz Cheney. Yeah, uh, for sure. Bye, everyone.